Hey everyone, this is Bradley Bush with another algebra video for you. Today we're talking about inverse functions and uh, specifically we'll give you a big picture what is about what is an inverse function. We'll also talk about some inverse function notation and then the meat of this video is uh, two fun facts about inverse functions. There's some cool symmetry that goes on and we'll talk about the horizontal line test which kind of helps you see if a function has an inverse. So let's start. So what is an inverse function? It's a really good question. So we start, say, with a function f. If we have a function, a function is kind of like a machine. It does things kind of like an assembly line. You put something on the assembly line that's kind of like your input to the function, and then it kind of moves down the assembly line, and at each step, something's done to it, some action's done to it. So in our specific situation here, we have an input, which is x. And the first thing that's done to it is it's multiplied by 3. So whatever you put into the function, the first thing that will happen is that thing will be multiplied by 3. The second thing that will happen is whatever the result is after you multiply by 3, that will be added to 2. So you add 2 after you multiply by 3. Those are the steps of the function, and then you're done. Your assembly line is finished, and your product is complete. So if you needed an inverse function, what an inverse function does is it kind of goes backwards on the assembly line. It's as if you're putting the product back on the assembly line, and then at each stage, the person who had done something to the function undoes what they did. So things are undone in the reverse order. Kind of like a movie that you see, like those fail compilations where you see something happen and then it reverses and you see the person going in back, going backwards in, like they're going back in time. It's the exact same thing. So the last thing that was done on our assembly line on our function was we added two. So that's going to be the first thing that's done on our inverse function. We're going to do the we're going to undo that. So how do you undo adding two? We you do the opposite, which is subtract two. So the first thing that's done to our input is we subtract two. And then after that, what's the next stop? So the last stop on our original function was adding two. The stop just before that was multiplying by three. So how do you undo multiplying by three? Well, you do the opposite. You divide by three. So that's what we do. We divide by three. That's what happens in our inverse function. So as a review and a summary, g, if g is the function inverse of f, then it undoes what f has done in the reverse order. Let's talk about some function notation. This is good to know. This negative one superscript, it kind of looks like an exponent, but it really isn't an exponent. Sometimes in algebra, you have exponents, right? You have stuff that looks like this. You'll have, say, maybe 3 to the negative 1. That really means you need to flip the base and everything's good. The exponent is now positive. But that's not the case. So when we're dealing with function notation, this does not count. This negative in the exponent is just a label. It just says this is the inverse of f. So f is the name of the function. And if you ever see a negative 1 superscript next to the f, or next to the name of the function, it's not an exponent. It is a label that says this is the inverse of x. Inverse of f, excuse me. So let's get to our fun facts. Fun fact number one. Inverse functions mirror each other over the line y equals x. Well, that's actually kind of cool because say you have this function here in blue, this f. 
and you can see what it look, looks like. Starts about 1.5 on the x-axis, and then as you move left, it slowly moves up, kind of like a square root function. If this f has an inverse, then that inverse will mirror itself over the y equals x axis. So if you fold the graph along this y equals x axis that I just highlighted the red line, if you fold it along that, you'd have a perfect match. So you can see it's actually kind of cool, right? You see the inverse function right here, and it looks like a perfect mirror. So that's one kind of cool part of this symmetry. Uh, the reason this happens can be explained by the domain and range sharing. So if you have a function that is, say, f, which is the blue one on the bottom, this one right here, then if we looked at this one that we just drew when we said, what's the domain? We would say it starts at 1.5 and goes to infinity and includes 1.5. And if we looked at the range, we'd say, well, there's nothing negative down here. So it starts at 0, it includes 0, and goes up to infinity. The inverse of that, or in other words, the function up top here, on the other side of y equals x, it shares these two domain and range, but they're flipped, right? So the domain of f is now the range of the inverse. And the range of f is now the domain of the inverse. So that is why you see the mirroring going on. So if you looked at a point, say this point right here, and we call that point a, b, the a is the x value, b is the y value, there would be a corresponding point over on the inverse, and the x and y's would be flipped the B would be in the X spot and the A would be in the Y spot. That's kind of cool. Kind of fun fact about inverse functions. Second fun fact about inverse functions is the horizontal line test. So I don't know if you knew, but if you take a horizontal line, say this one right here, if you can touch the graph of a function anywhere, more than once, then that function doesn't have an inverse. So because we can see we can touch twice, we this graph we have, this parabola, doesn't have an inverse function. Interesting. Why is that? Why, why would that be? Well, if we looked at the values here. Say this is 1 and this is 5 and my y value here that's 2. So the point here would be 1 comma 2 and the point to the right would be 5 comma 2, right? The coordinates of the points, the xy coordinates. Notice that we have repeating outputs. So that's not a problem for a function, right? Because we don't care about the outputs. You could have as many repeating outputs as you want. You just can't have repeating inputs to be a function. So this parabola f is a function. This green parabola here is a function. But the fact that we have repeating outputs, these twos, that means if we looked for an inverse function, if this parabola had an inverse function. What do we know about inverse functions? We just learned from fun fact number one that it's domain and range flop. So that means these repeated twos that are in the range of f would be then in the domain of the inverse. And we can't have repeating inputs in a function. So that's why this function doesn't have an inverse function because the inverse, if it had an inverse, it would have repeating inputs. And so it would no longer be classified as a function. So it doesn't exist. The inverse function doesn't exist because it doesn't pass the test. All right, well, that's it.
those are two fun facts about inverse functions. Thanks for watching and hope it's helpful.